It's Friday, January 20th, 2017, and you know what that means. Donald Trump gets inaugurated at noon today. I hope you're done with your morning, folks, because now it's time to get in gear and organize to stand up and fight. This is Kevin Mahoney, editor and founder of Raging Chicken Press and Raging Chicken Media. And each week I talk to our capital muckraker in chief, Sean Kitchen, about the good, the bad and the ugly in state and national politics. So on today's show, uh, there's no way to avoid it, folks. We'll get into our thoughts on Inauguration Day. Now, we are recording this before the inauguration takes place. So um, we'll get to our thoughts on the actual inauguration, anything that kind of goes on during the inauguration, the protests that take place. Um, we'll get to that next week on next week's show, or maybe we'll even have a special session. We'll see. Uh, but today we'll talk a little bit about what's on our minds. And also today, we're going to talk about some bad signs coming out of the PA Democratic Party. It looks like they just may not have learned their lessons from the 2016 election. And I don't know how more glaring it needs to be, um, but uh, we'll, we'll, we're going to get to that. Um, I'm a little worked up about the, um, some of the directions that the, the Democratic Party in the Pennsylvania may be going. Um, so we've also got some really exciting announcement, or Anna really exciting announcement today about the Rick Smith Show um, and the expansion of progressive media. Um, some hopeful signs on this dark day. And we also got some music to share with you today, um, some music for the resistance. So all that and more on today's show. I want to remind you, uh, literally, literally now more than ever, folks, um, you can keep Raging Chicken Media going strong, progressive activist media right here in Pennsylvania by becoming a member for as little as two bucks a month. I mean, we're digging in for 2017 and Trumplandia, and we need you. We need the progressive community to help us out, to deepen pull no punches progressive media that will hold power accountable. Our new team of writers is already doing that. You've already seen that in the pages of Raging Chicken Press, but you simply need to go to the um, ragingchickenpress.org and look for the support and membership tab at the top. You can just click on become a member right? And then it'll take you right on your way. Uh, we're also on Patreon. So you go to that same tab and you click on be a patron. You can become a member that way through Patreon. Or if you're just not ready yet to make the commitment, become a member to help out progressive media right here in PA in the region, um, you can still make a one-time donation under that same tab by just clicking donate and they'll take you to a, a PayPal site. So um, Sean, it's here, man. It's here. The mothership has cometh. It has come. It's like that scene from Independence Day when the mothership just comes through the horizon, and there it is. There, 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 there she is. That's true, you know. And I, and I think that, uh, you know, the way you said that has cometh. I think we just may need to start talking like in old English or medieval <laughs> English now. Uh, I think that would be more appropriate for what's headed our way. <laughs> yeah. Well, we are we are probably going to go back to the Dark Ages over the next four years. Um, we're going to skip skip the Renaissance and go back to the fucking Dark Ages. Uh, you know, burn all the science books, burn all the history books. You know, don't do anything about education. Don't do anything about climate change. You know, just go boom right back to the 1300s. And it'll be great. It'll be great. <laughs> Make the 1300s great again. <laughs> I said, yeah, exactly. I said one of the um, one of my favorite memes that kind of just that I popped up in one of my feeds uh, this week was. Uh, um, don't forget to set your clocks back 300 years tonight. <laughs> yeah. I, let, let, I, I say we just set our clocks, clocks back to like pre Magna Carta. Uh, yeah. You know, because that, that's where it seems like our society is going, our civilization is going. Uh, you know, it's going to be a long, rough uh, four years. And, uh, you know, one of the things I'm really afraid of, uh, I had this conversation last night with, um, you know, a kid that's 18 years old uh -huh. and um, he's home from college uh, working uh, at the pizza shop. And he said, you know, he said he's not worried about Trump, but what he's worried about is his friends. Uh, his friends, he has a lot of gay and black friends um, and, you know, people, friends of color and where he goes to college. And he said he's more worried about them than he is about himself. And then mm -hmm. uh, he's not worried about Trump doing anything, but he's worried about the racists and the bigots that are empowered because of Trump. And yeah, well, and, you know, and that's that's a real thing. You know, I mean, that's a real thing to be worried about. And it's, you know, I have to say it's good, good on him. Right. Good on that kid recognize number one that okay you know he might not be directly impacted on it right but members in his community right his friends his uh you know are are, are going to be impacted and um so that's good now let's hope that we have people that are out there i mean i've heard similar stories like this too as well and let's hope that those those folks who recognize 
that there's an issue um, are willing to do more than just recognize it, right? They're willing to actually become part of solidarity networks um, and to organize to protect our communities. Because um, I really do think that's gonna be a big part of um, what we need to do over the next four to eight years is um, yes, we need to build our organizations, but we need to do build our organizations in a way that, you know, are, are defensive. And I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm always a fan of going on the offense and we do need to do some of that too as well, but we have to have our, our defenses ready too to protect each other. Yeah, there's gonna be a lot of stuff over the next four years. <laughs> I'll say, I'll say. So, you know, I, you know, here we go. And I want to, I want to let people in on some of the conversations that we've been having uh, on Raging Chicken. Um, you know, one of the things that, that it may sound small, but you know, this is something I think that a lot of progressive media um, that we're talking about is how even to kind of refer to like, you know, the incoming Trump administration, you know, I mean, th here's a guy who, um, there's all sorts of questions about forget you know yes all the conflict of interest and things like this but you know international involvement in kind of in our elections um and tampering with the elections um and you know i'm using tampering in a broad sense right at this point there's no evidence that you know on election day there were internet hacks into the election process and things like this but in terms of an overall offensive um by a foreign government now it even looks like there may have been direct connections between the trump um, um campaign staff um and russia during the campaign um we'll see how that plays itself out um but you're also talking about um a guy who was elected by you know w w by losing the popular vote by almost three million votes um and someone who has represented what a lot of us think are are non-american values um and i say that you know knowing the, you know the, the the fraught history of this country and the fraught history of quote unquote american values um but you know i think that what you just brought up there sean about you know this 18 year old kid i mean at the very least you think that we were getting to that point where you know, uh, say, you know, gays and lesbians, for example, had the right to marry now, you have the right to marry now, or, you know, have, have you know, polls have shown that tides have turned in terms of how we're expanding our communities and accepting folks in our communities. And that is, uh, you know, we're on the verge of having that turn back. Yeah, and we're also on the verge of having other things turn back. I was reading something earlier today, um, Violence Against Women Act may actually get repealed under Donald Trump, uh, mm -hmm. something that Obama fought hard for and actually had to get through, you know, uh, with political maneuvering, you know, uh, with the uh, Republicans who are against him. You know, the Violence, uh, violence Against the Women Act yep. might get repealed. Um, you know, uh, one of the things I was thinking about before we started, um, <clears throat> and we were just saying about how uh, Clinton won the popular vote by three and a half million votes. I think it was maybe like a week or two after the election uh, Sam Cedar had a guest on talking about uh, talking about compulsory voting in your deep blue states. So you drive that divide, even you you drive that wedge further and further. Further, you make people vote in California. You make people vote in New York. So the next time this happens, instead of winning by three and a half million votes, you win by seven or eight million votes, and you don't get the electoral college. You, right. you make that you drive that divide deeper and deeper. And one of the things I think we have to do as progressive media is. He's make sure we remind people that he is an Ill illegitimate president and yeah. not illegitimate because of what's happening with Russia. Yes, you can make that argument illegitimate because he lost by three and a half million votes. He lost. That was the largest, what, one of the largest uh, defeats ever in Electoral College history or popular vote history. And he still won the election. You know, I think, you know, we don't call him President Trump. We call him Trump or as President Trump. Um, yeah, you, you just cut out there, Sean. You said, you, you, got, you said uh, we call him Trump or... Or we call him Trump or just Donald Trump. We don't call him President Trump. You know, we, we divide that. We, 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 it's our job. I think it's our job as activist media and independent media to drive that wedge further and further and really, um, you know, be that wedge and split the people in half. You know? I, I think you're I think you're right. And I want to and I, you know, and I, I recognize that there are people out there who um on the left too, right? You know, I mean, who who get a little bit more uncomfortable when you talk about kind of calling the illegitimate president or, um, you know, saying that you know he's he's been voted, follow the rules, and all that kind of stuff. It wasn't like, you know, it was overtly stolen or something like that. You know, and there's people that respect these institutions and they they say, okay, yes, like like it or not, you know, we wouldn't want that to happen if it was one of our presidents. Well, you know, it did, right, with Obama. But I, I think here's the point, right? I think the point about why that it's important now to do exactly what you said is because we've seen over the past 
at minimum eight years, but it's been longer than that. But let's just use the Obama administration as an example. Um, we've seen a, a party that after spending decades, right, fanning the flames of its base, um, expanding its uh, kind of right wing media infrastructure through talk radio, Fox News and so on. Right. Um, and reporting and creating this kind of world of lies and misrepresentations <clears throat> to basically um, create this radical fringe, right, this radical right wing fringe. And it's, it's helped kind of goose that along, if you will. And what they showed during, during the Obama administration that all those things that had been kind of norms in our political life up until then, right, institutional norms and so and so on, the Republicans have been willing to completely throw out the window, right? And it's it's that it's that example of like you know if everyone if we're all in the same game. Right. We're all playing that same game. We don't want, you know, we, we want to respect the rules, even if we don't like the rules, even if the rules don't work to, to our advantage. This time, right. You want to respect the rules. But that only works if both sides, both people or groups of people are playing by the same sets of rules. Right. If, you know, we're sitting here, and want to respect the institutions and all this, you know, today is a peaceful transfer of power. I keep on hearing this on media and things like this. Well, yeah, that's true. Right. Except we're doing it in a way that is fundamentally different from before. And it's disorienting at times um, when you start to kind of get in this abstract space of saying like, well, we need to respect these institutions. When you're talking about like a party, right, not just Donald Trump, the entire Republican Party has decided to kind of have a strategy of throwing out any kind of political norms um, that we should respect. All sorts of civility, all a sense of like how you kind of treat a president, how you kind of engage in politics that's been thrown out the window. So we're at this point now, if we actually care about any of those norms, right, respectability, civility, and so on like this, then we have to fight. This goes back to like, you know, uh, you know, I go back to Thomas Paine on this, where Thomas Paine had this, um, these big arguments about the, um, uh, the Quakers is saying like, yeah, you know, you can you know, talk about, you know, nonviolence and all this kind of stuff, that's fine. Um, but if you've got British troops that are in the street that are kind of killing our people and they're kind of are stealing our money, then we have to be prepared to stand up and fight for those norms, right? For that civility, right? But you and have to things, kind of engage in battle in the meantime. And one of the things where, um, like, you know, we're talking about this and one of the things that really like irked me, pissed me off over the past couple of days is, you know, <clears throat> I would like to uh, commend, I would like to like thank uh, representatives Boyle, Brady, Doyle, and... Um, the, the last Philadelphia representative, Evans, um, mm -hmm. for all skipping out on this election, mm -hmm. or skipping out on the inauguration today, right? Mm -hmm. I would like to thank those four representatives. But how come Matt Cartwright and Bob Casey are going to attend today's inauguration? They shouldn't be going to today's inauguration. Frankly, any Democrat shouldn't be going to inauguration. They should all be out there skipping the inauguration. There should be a hundred, there should be every single Democrat in that building uh, in that Senate and in that um, House chamber should be skipping today's inauguration to show to tell to tell Trump that they're that they're not going to stand up and take. You know, I agree. You know, I agree. And this, like you, this shows you, you want to drive that wedge. You know, like you're still playing by those norms that got thrown out. You know, you no. This is where you. This is a line in the sand. You don't attend today's inauguration, in my opinion. That's a line in the sand. You no, attend I, that inauguration. You are complicit with Donald Trump. Yeah, and I, you know, and the way I look at it is like this too, as well as you know, this is. It shows you the kind of work that we need to go, we need to do going forward. And we're not going to have time to kind of get into all this today on today's show, but it's going to be one of the kind of ongoing conversations we're going to have here um, about the role of the Democratic Party and how do we engage the Democratic Party if we do engage the Democratic Party. There's lots of debates already. Do we start a third party and so on? I mean, I've got my thoughts on this. Um, but the good thing I say, I would say at least, is that you know it's over fifty now um, of Democrats who are not going to attend the, um, the I think inauguration. It's over 60, actually, is it over sixty now? Yes, so, I think it was over sixty over the past couple of days. That's excellent. So um, w there's where we start, right? That's um, your resistance. That's where your leaders are at, right there. It, well, that's the, at least the leaders within the Democratic Party, right? I mean, you know, this is what we have to recognize is that there's going to be a lot of leadership that's going to have to come from outside the Democratic Party. And I think that's, um, you know, a, what we're going to see a lot of our focus is also going to be is beyond that, those kind of movements, right? Looking on at the leadership that's happening outside the party, because if, if there's any lesson that we have to learn, right, um, is that without the power of organization, without the power of people organized in, in movements and political movements and strong ones, right, the Democratic Party will do what the Democratic Party just did for the past few decades, right? Um, it will not move, right? We cannot count on them, right? But right now we have this split 
organizations should kind of acknowledge just as you did right acknowledge that as that as that split and say you know kudos to them right um for standing up and kind of making that visible um and then we also have to kind of point out when you know people like bob casey just don't you know we got some flack for that last week for um you know pointing out that bob casey was uh, instrumental in helping shoot down uh, uh, Bernie Sanders and Amy Klobuchar's amendment when it came to um, when it, you know, through that reconciliation process when they're trying to re uh, repeal a the ACA. Um, but you know what? That's what we got to do. Um, and I think there's fissures within the Democratic Party. We support those that side that is going to um, kind of be stand with people and those folks who want to kind of pretend and get their head in their sand and pretend that we're living in some sort of normal times. Well, you know, we're just not folks. So listen, we're, we're coming right up to a break. and we come back from the break, we're going to get into this on the PA Democratic Party a little bit. Sean and I have been talking a little bit about this and um, got some things that are some kind of uh, what I would call disturbing developments um, in, in the PA De Democratic Party. Uh, we also got some announcements about, uh, like I said, at the top of the show, um, the Rick Smith show and some expansion of progressive media, which is going to be pretty cool. Um, but going into this break, we're gonna, this is going to be a different break we normally hear. We're going to push the uh, labor history in two towards the end to the second break. Um, but we've got this um, this group from, um, uh, I think they're St. Louis, I want to say, um, called The Invisible World. And uh, they reached out to me this week and um, they wrote a song uh, specifically for um the incoming trump administration and, and but not for trump um for all of us and um, the song is simply called the resistance um it was released uh let's see let's see it was released on the 17th right so earlier this week um and you can actually go and download the song right it's a page what you want track um through their website and we'll put links to this in the show notes um or through Bandcamp. and all proceeds right all proceeds will go to Planned Parenthood and the Midwest Music Foundation, right? Um, so we're gonna support them. We reached out to them. We made a contribution to them. Uh, we wanna share the song with you and to encourage that you go check out welcome to the invisible world.com slash the resistance that's welcome to the invisible world.com slash the resistance um but uh i'll give you that it's, check out the song and uh after the song we'll be back and we're going to talk a little about the pa democratic party and media moving forward this is kevin yeah. Mahoney, editor and founder of raging chicken press we'll be right back Welcome back to Raging Chicken Radio's Out to Coop podcast. Uh, at the break, um, we were talking a little bit about um, uh, some developments in PA Democratic Party, um, kind of the, the kind of work that we're going to need to do um, in terms of holding um, not just the people in the incoming Trump administration accountable, but also um, folks within the Democratic Party. Um, <clears throat> and let me make it clear from the onset here, I have no... Um, I don't have my head in the sand about the Democratic Party being some sort of uh, kind of progressive, you know, vanguard or something like that. Uh, I do think it is the party that is there for us to make strides in. And like I said, we'll, we will um, have more on that um, coming down. There's some um, I want to give a shout out in this podcast, too, as well, to um, an organization that's up in, uh, I think it's Lehigh County. It's called the East Penn Democratic Club. Um, I heard one of their members come on the, uh, the majority report and call in last week. Um, and it sounds like they've got some amazing work that's going on there. We're going to have them on, um, one of the other segments of our podcast from Raging Chicken Radio, um, in a couple upcoming weeks, we've been back and forth talking about some of the work that they're doing and they're putting a lot of investment in, um, local organizing right, um, and um, a kind of progressive activist work. So there's already some of those moves that people have decided, you know what, we're gonna start, to, we're gonna take over these organizations and we're gonna push them in much more progressive um, um, fashion. One other announcement before I forget, um, if you remember um, this, on the 28th, there was supposed to be uh, at Muhlenberg College, a thing called How We Fight it was being uh, an event that was being put on by um, Representative uh, Michael Schlossberg um, from Allentown. Uh, that event is being postponed, um, but it's being postponed for a very good reason. Um, they had such overwhelming response um, that the space was too small. So um, uh, Schlossberg is looking for a larger space um, to bring in more people. Um, that is a really encouraging sign. I was very disappointed when I, when I first read it, and then I looked at why it was, and I'm very thrilled about um, to know that there's a lot of people that want to get involved. So there are some important signs on the horizon. 
Um, but so with those kind of important signs, um, people organizing for kind of grassroots campaigning and activism and progressive causes, it seems like, Sean, we've got some uh, pushes in the opposite direction coming out from the PA Democratic Party. Tell us a little about that. Yeah, it seems like uh, Governor Tom Wolf and the uh, leaders of the, the his the leader that he, leaders that he installed uh, for the Democratic Party uh, are not um, learning from this past election. Uh, they have both come out against Keith Ellison um, for to lead the DNC. Uh, they both uh, said that. Um, <clears throat> Uh, well, Marcel Groen said he doesn't want someone who makes waves. He wants someone who actually fundraise money, and uh, we see we see how that worked for Marcel and the PA Democratic Party this past election. Uh, it was their it was their idea to uh, run Katie McGinty, a wholly unqualified uh, person for the United States Senate. I've said that from the start. Um, mm -hmm. I said she was completely unqualified uh, to, for any public office uh, when she was running for governor. Uh, these were based on the personal interactions I've had with her and based on the stories of her um, being in Harrisburg. And um, I've, frankly, I was not surprised that she lost. Um, they wasted millions of dollars on running her against Joe Sestak in a contested primary. Um, oh, and there was also a lot of other things going on. Uh, there were there weren't two. There were two. There were two bad choices in my opinion. In opinion, Sestak and uh, McGinty, and that's why I voted for John Fetterman. Um, a lot of people, a lot of progressives, were upset with uh, those who voted for Fetterman because it took votes away from Sestak. But um, <clears throat> which, hey, it happens. But um, McGinty was ran because the party did not like Sestak. They lost, and now the party uh, does not want to endorse Keith Ellison uh, for. Um, uh, for uh, lead the DN the national DNC because he will he'll, he he just says he has flashy headlines, you know they they don't and then he doesn't want someone with, who runs with flashy headlines. Yeah, he wants yeah. somebody what that's going to freaking stand on the sidelines and he bury their head stiff. in the. I mean, yeah, I mean, it's, it's unbelievable. Like, stiff like Bob Casey. <laughs> No, that, that I think that's right, but I think that's right. And the, and the, thing, that, the thing that you pointed out, the thing you said about you know about Fetterman and the, the people getting pissed off the Sestak people. Well, let's put this in, in in context here. I mean, I voted for Fetterman too as well. Is like the choice. Look, Sestak, right, was no Sestak spectacular was candidate either. And I, I remember like when we were, when I was working with Rick, um, we were looking at Sestak's book like twenty minutes before Sestak came in, and he got through like most of it, like leading up to that one interview. And Sestak was praising uh, the privatization of highways out in Indiana and out in Chicago, and Rick was just like completely baffled about this. Like, are you kidding me? These were two of the like privatizing the Skyway in Chicago. He called that one. Of the, he called it a great, um, a great. Uh, he, he he praised pr privatizing the Skyway. You know, Sestak was not no uh, liberal progressive champion by no, by any stretch of the imagination. No, exactly. And this this is exactly my point, right? So the two top candidates, right? The two top candidates We're of the pro Democratic Party coming out. natural gas Democrats. Exactly, right? The, this is what they had. This is who they cultivated. Why vote for John Fetterman is because that's what the Democratic Party in this in this state should be should be doing. Right? I mean, the fact is, if you look at, like, I mean, the Democratic Party, I, I swear to God, is a, the, the, critiques, the critiques that come about the Democratic Party about being elitist and all this kind of stuff, you know, people on the left sometimes brush that off. Or I say liberals, not people on the left don't, but people um, like left left, like, like real left. Um, but, you know, liberals are kind of Democrats. History, they brush that off as just kind of right wing criticism. But, man, there's real truth in that. If you just look at where the PA Democratic Party have, have uh, put their resources, they put their resources in places where they already think that they can win. Right. Like in Philadelphia and Pittsburgh and some of the surrounding areas. That's it. Right. The Lehigh Valley, for example. Right. Which I have always said. Right. For as long as I've lived here. Right. Is that like, that is the future of Pennsylvania right there. It's the third largest population um, population region in the state. Right. And it's virtually neglected by the PA Democratic Party. That right there is a perfect example of that. And, and there, all of these small cities and towns all throughout this state. Right. The Democratic Party in the state have just written off. They don't even compete in those things. They don't put resources. They don't organize in that. And yeah. I don't know what you call that other than freaking like, you know, I don't know. Liberal elitists in the cities. I mean, that's what that's what it's kind of points. To. And one of the things that they had like a challenge to that. And one of the things that uh, happened this uh, year. So Democrats who are in safe seats, right? I think a report came out by Morning Call this week. Something like twenty Democrats gave zero dollars of their own campaign cash, you know, to uh, 
<clears throat> to um to the to the House Democratic Campaign Committee, and you know, and, and they still get their leadership positions. Uh, Dermody still gives them their leadership positions when they were fucking deadbeats within the party, and they give no money to to uh, give uh, to get other Democrats elected and pick up seats. You know, these are the people. They're a party of fucking losers. You know, Dermody, Sterla. Hannah, all these people, they get rewarded for losing, uh, giving the House a fucking supermajority, giving the Senate a supermajority, and what do they do? They reward themselves by keeping themselves in leadership for the past six years. I'm sorry, this is getting me really pissed off, but, like, these people are a party of losers. You know, the quote Cenk Uger, they're losers. They don't know how to win. Winning is not in vo their, their vocabulary. What's in their vocabulary is protecting their own asses and not uh, respecting the resources anywhere else. You know, one of the things I was looking at that same story, Peter Schweier, uh, representative yep. from uh, representative from <clears throat> from uh, Allentown, who I know, um, and he basically said, "Yeah, you can't just give two hundred fifty dollars to the Democratic campaign committee and say, hey, all right, there it is.' No, you have to give five or ten or fifteen thousand dollars of your own exactly. campaign cash to get other people elected. That is your duty as a Democratic representative in a safe district to give money to the party." to make sure other Democrats get elected. And what happens? You have a bunch of fucking deadbeats in this party and they get and they get uh they, they they get rewarded by keeping by not giving any money to the party and they keep their own fucking leadership positions. Well, that's that's right. And I think that here's and here's the difference, right? And I think that 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 way of thinking, right? Um was I true for a long time from my understanding. It had been true for a long time on both sides, right? It had been both Republicans and Democrats in the state kind of operated like that. Right. Um, it was kind of like a much more low key thing that all changed. Right. That all changed, like with the election of Obama a little bit before when you started seeing the same kind of dynamics that we saw in other states like Wisconsin and Indiana and Ohio, Michigan, right across the board, like all this kind of Alec based kind of Republican playbook where um, they switched it up. That's why we had the kind of the in, intense gerrymandering we had in the state. Pennsylvania was targeted as one of the states to do this. And then you, that's why you have people like Scott Wagner, right, who have emerged in, in, in the party leadership on the right, right, who understand exactly what you do. That's why Scott Wagner went there with bags of campaign cash to help out other kinds of candidates. That does not happen on the Democratic side. And then the other thing is, let, let's be clear about this. I think that the dynamic that you just laid out is not true of all Democrats in the PA Democratic Party. Like, I mean, I think Michael Schlossberg is a perfect example of this as someone who's actually put some time into organizing, right? Some time into kind of doing that kind of community-based organizing and so on. There's some other people across the state in that party who have been pushing, right, to get elected. I'm thinking, uh, you know, Kara Strayer, right? Or Strayer is her last name? Like up up in the kind of um, north northwest side of the state, where she's really put in some time to actually do some community organizing and things like this. But these are the candidates that are not seeing extensive support from the party apparatus, and that is exactly the problem that we're kind of pointing to. So I mean, that's incredibly incredibly frustrating. The Democrats picked up flipped one seat in November, one seat, and they won it by twenty five votes. And they picked off someone in Chester County who was a crazy conservative. And what happened? They won. I mean, you, you, you listen, the, the, you're, yes, the districts are gerrymandered in a way where most of them could be 60 40. But if you do actual on the ground organizing and put uh, campaign cash into these districts, you know, instead of just protecting your own ass and make sure you get reelected and no one else gets the money, you know, which is what the Dermody and others have been doing. They give it to, to, to the incumbents and they don't focus on picking up seats. You know, like the whole entire party is, is, is like the leadership of the Democratic Party is why we are here today. Uh, well, and, and I say, exactly. And I say, and I would say this, I would say that if you look at that, exactly that leadership of the Democratic Party in, nationally, absolutely, here in Pennsylvania, especially, especially when P, uh, Pennsylvania was being targeted by the right. And let's, let's be clear, folks, is that this is one of the states, right, that, that Hillary Clinton lost and why we have Donald Trump. And if that is not writing on the wall about the failures of this, the stories that have been coming out of Pennsylvania about what happened during the Hillary Clinton campaign, forget about like the, the actual, you know, what the presidential candidates were saying. The campaign organizing. In Pennsylvania, there were people that were showing up, right? First of all, there were people that were running um, the campaign out of their front yards, right? In major kind of, uh, kind of, uh, Places where basically the Democratic Party populated should've... places like where where the old steel mills exactly are at. <laughs> right like right like right in the Lehigh Valley in right Bristol, in Montgomery in County Croydon. right in Bucks County right all these places that they even the, even the Hillary Clinton campaign said 
that was that was key. They had no resources, right? So, and the PA Democratic Party had absolutely no plan. So it was basically the sweat of volunteers. There were people that were showing up on election day, right, to people that they thought were Hillary Clinton voters, only to find out on election day that they were getting out the vote with Trump voters. They were showing up at Trump voters' places saying, you got to get out and vote today. And like, oh my God, that was a Trump voter, not a Hillary voter. And one of the things that, that, that was a failure of the state party as well as the national party. And one of the things that like locally on here in Dauphin County, I heard this story out of the Dauphin County Democratic Party had canvassers out on a Saturday in downtown Harrisburg, which is a fucking ghost town on Saturdays, canvassing for Hillary Clinton. And uh, Roxbury was talking about talking with people, dude, you should be like uh, across the river talking to these people over there in Cumberland County, or you should be. Uh, you know, up in Allison Hill, up in Uptown, where, you know, your poor communities are at who need to get out the vote because all the people down here are going to go, go vote. You, you have like, like what Rick said, you have a bunch of ones and fives. These people were dead set ones. They were going to get out and vote for Clinton no matter what. So why are you canvassing people who are going to go out and go vote no matter what? I must have had like the same Planned Parenthood person knock on my door three times in the, in the lead up to the election. I'm like, listen, I'm going to vote regardless. Stop knocking on my door. <laughs> like, Go talk to the people that are not going to vote or that you need to convince. I mean, it was it. We had, I'll tell you this. We had the, what was, what was stark. What, what, I mean, just what, what blew my mind is that um, every election up until this one that I've lived, I live in Percocet, right? Percocet, Pennsylvania is that is every election up until, um, uh, until this, this one that when we're moving up to election, this includes off year elections, off non-presidential election years. We always have people come up and canvassing and kind of knocking on our doors and things like this, right? We're always, we'll talk to people, blah, blah, blah. This year, we didn't even see people in our neighborhood, right? And this is an area that has kind of, you know, it's mixed. I mean, yes, it's, it's, it's GOP has got a, it's got a heavy GOP leading in the area, but you have increasingly <laughs> kind of like Democrats moving into the area, right? So, and no one showed up. And then, then my wife said is that it wasn't until the weekend before the election, she saw a group of kids. They were probably 18 or 19 years old, right? Clearly had no idea what the heck they were doing around with clipboards, just kind of like walking through the neighborhood and afraid to even go up and approach people at their doors, right? That shows you that there had been no training. There had been no experience um, in kind of getting people ready to do that kind of canvassing. It was unbelievable. But listen, we're, we're running up to a break right here. Um, um, one thing I want to say, I wanna, this, this is what I, one thing I want to say before the break and before we kind of do a little um, kind of fun stuff for the day, I've got a major, major announcement. Um, you all know that uh, we have been working with the Rick Smith Show um, uh, for a long time now. Uh, I'm usually on on Mondays. Rick's show is now, the, he changed up the format a little bit, so now it's running from 10 to 12 um, uh, weekdays instead of 3 to 6. Um, so it's from 10 to 12, so we've been, he's been kind of re, re, redoing the, uh, the structure of the show. Um, so we haven't been on regularly so far in 2017. We will be very soon. But so on we'll be Raging Mondays, we'll be on there for Raging Chicken, talking about events for the week. Um, we've uh, Rick and I have met quite a bit, um, strategizing about how to move forward, uh, how to expand progressive media in Pennsylvania, across the region, or across the country. Um, and a lot of times we've been hitting our heads uh, up against the wall. Um, but all that work is, is really paying off. And so we've got some amazing news to announce today. Um, that Rick, the Rick Smith show is now going to be expanding to 40 million homes nationwide. So check this out, folks. The Rick Smith show and free speech TV are teaming up to bring our nationally recognized radio program, program, the Rick Smith show, the nation's television airways. So mark your calendars, everybody for Saturday, February 18th at 7 PM Eastern standard time. The Rick Smith show will be on free speech TV and free speech TV is a national network that reaches over 40 million households nationwide via a full-time channel on Dish, um, Dish Network, channel um, 9415, Direct TV channel 348, and Community Access channels nationwide. Free Speech TV is also available on Roku, Google Nexus, and Amazon Fire. You can also get it streaming online um, at uh, freespeechtv.com. Um, and this is going to be a weekly hour long program that will focus on issues faced by working people across the political spectrum and share news and information about what is happening in DC and in state capitals across the nation. Um, you know, today as, as Trump, and this is from the, the press release today, today, Donald Trump becomes the 45th president of the United States of America. And the Rick Smith show will be there to hold his administration accountable on issues facing working people. Um, you know, I would urge people, um, if you want to help support the Rick Smith show, go to ricksmithshow.com. 
and click donate, right? And help make this um, make this like just an amazing, amazing opportunity. I'm so excited. We're gonna be working with Rick um, all throughout this process in a consulting role. Um, we'll do what we can to help him um, kind of on the framework, you know, um, anything set up and promotional materials and all this kind of stuff. But congratulations to Rick Smith. Um, I look forward to February 18th to the launch of the Rick Smith Show on Free Speech TV. So with that, uh, we're going to give you a little voice of Rick Smith through his uh, labor history in two. And after this break, uh, we'll come back and we'll hopefully have some, uh, maybe some fun things or interesting things to talk to you in the, the final closing. This is Kevin Mahoney, editor and founder of Raging Chicken. We'll be back right after this. Welcome back to Raging Chicken Radio's Out the Coop podcast. So, Sean, uh, on this day, on this day, uh, Inauguration Day, uh, do we have any, I don't know, good news, hopeful news, or what the hell are we going to be uh, drinking when it comes to <laughs> uh, once, this, once this is all over? What's up? Well, <clears throat> um, I guess uh, we actually this day is not going to be that bad uh, since President Trump's first uh, or Donald Trump's first act as president is to uh, take the weekend off. So really, we don't have to worry about anything until Monday. So, <laughs> <coughs> Well, the question is, is who's going to be minding the store while he's doing whatever the heck he's doing up in New York? Yeah, it's gonna be it's gonna be really interesting to see what happens, especially the the stuff uh, with New York City, what uh, De Blasio is gonna be doing with the pressuring uh, Donald Trump and the administration, the or, or the Trump organization, mm -hmm. as Sam Seder calls it, which I, the name I like a lot. Yeah, I think I think we definitely should uh, give the props to Sam Seder and the Majority Report for that, and I think that we should adopt that and refer to the Trump administration as the Trump organization, um, since that seems to be um, closer to the way he's running things. Uh, one of the things I wanted to touch on that we didn't get to touch on yet uh, was the Betsy DeVos hearing. Oh man, yeah. How much of a fucking train wreck was that? You know, I, I think I think we might even, you know, you and I, we might have to have a, a have to have to have a a, a special session. Um, see if we can get some time before next Friday, um, to just run through some of the um some of the hearings and stuff because the DeVos hearing was crazy. The Price hearing was nuts. Um, the uh, I mean, the DeVos was just more of like you just you just can't believe what the hell's going on. She doesn't even know what she's talking about, but that's what, you know, people have been saying, we've been paying attention for a long time. Um, so let's, let's see if we can set up some time to, to kind of just talk about that. Um, just because, uh, I, I think we'll, we'll, we, we should give it some, give it some order. And I just think, you know, being inauguration day today, there's a lot, we just didn't get a chance to talk about. Yeah. Um, one of the good things that I felt like yesterday was actually pretty neat. Um, so gorillas that, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the concept band out of England, um, mm -hmm. That is a animated concept band, not not, not like real life. Uh, they came out with a new song yesterday. The artist from that uh, group came out with a new song yesterday called Hallelujah Money, uh, featuring nice. a, uh, a poet, uh, Benjamin Clementine. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was actually like reciting the lyrics of the song, not, sing not singing it. And the uh, video starts with him standing in an animated uh, animated elevator uh, hallway of Trump Tower, and he's taking this uh, elevator straight up to top of Trump Tower, and talking about all the vices and everything that Trump has brought out over the past uh, over the election cycle. And um, you know, it's great. Uh, that's what we need more of. We need we, we need artists. We, this is, you know, uh, t talk about like Chris Hedges and Death of the Liberal Class. You know, one of the books that really has stayed with me over these years is. Mm -hmm. We need artists to get back involved in this. Uh, well, you know, I'm glad you're. I'm, yeah, sorry. Go ahead. But we need we need artists and writers and anyone who has uh, any type of intellectual skill or creative skill to get involved and drive this resistance because those are the ones that are going to do it. Well, and I, you know, I think this. Is a, I, I should mention this now. Um, you know, we talked a little bit about this during during the break. Um, but I, I I think we're going to release here, and and this is for anybody who's, who's still listening um, to today's podcast. Please pass this on. But well, I'm going to have to promote push this out also on our sites. Um, so what we're thinking about doing here, um, and this goes right along with what Sean was just saying, is that. Um, we would like to, you know, we got that piece that we played earlier on in the podcast from the invisible world, um, called the resistance. Um, as a reminder, you can go to, um, you know, the invisible and let me see, I just got that one, right? Uh, do I have the right one here? It's the invisible world. Well, I'll come back to it later. 
I think it's invisibleworld.com, but the song for Resistance, if you look up the Invisible World of Resistance, um, you can go and you can download that. It's a pay um, pay as what whatever you can um, for the download, and uh, all proceeds go to um, Planned Parenthood and the Midwest Music Foundation. So um, what we would like to do, uh, especially in Pennsylvania and across this region, if you have um, original pieces of music, right, a little pieces of protest music um, that are connected to the resistance, um, to the Trump organization, um, and um, about kind of building strong political power. Um, I'd love to be able to feature them on this podcast, right? Um, and we'll put together a little, you know, kind of gift for you. Uh, we'll promo uh, the song. Uh, we'll promo your band. Um, or if it's just you, um, you're writing it, that's fine. And we'll play them right here on Raging Chicken Radio. And we'll also feature them on, on Raging Chicken Press. Um, and, you know, ideally what we can do is we can actually uh, help facilitate putting together a compilation of, um, you know, protest music, um, original protest music, original kind of political music uh, that's coming out in resistance to the Trump organization and um, what awaits us as we move forward. So if you got something like that, just shoot it at me at ragingchickenpress at gmail.com. It's probably the best place to make sure I get it right away, or you can send it to editor at ragingchickenpress.org. Um, and you know, Sean is right. Um, any uh, important political movement has always been marked by um, you know having artists um, as an integral part of what's going on, and um, music has been a big part of that, so... Yeah. So, Sean, so we get here tonight, right? Um, this inauguration is going to happen. Um, you know, I think that um, maybe the reason why Donald Trump has taken the weekend off is because I don't think even he believed it was going to happen. So he's got to go home and pack up his house. <laughs> he's got to have stuff for the uh, for the White House. He's got to figure out, you know, is he going to bring how many cans of tuna is he going to bring down there? Because he probably doesn't even know that he actually has his on-site cook at this point. But uh, oh, I thought I thought he was move, moving everything up to Trump Tower. I thought it was the other way around. I thought Trump Tower was going to become a new White House. No, no, he's he's got to you know he's got that one dresser drawer that he's got to have uh, overnight clothes in. He's got to make sure he gets the right stuff there, and he's got to figure out. I'm sure he's going to be doing a bunch of pictures so that how they can gild the White House to make sure it's all all golden inside, so he feels right at home. And there, there's one thing I was hopeful. Did you see the uh, the the protests that was popping up on uh, the screens? I guess Friday. I was night? just about to say it last night too. Or wait, right. no, Friday night or Saturday night when they're having um, a bunch of members from the LGBT community were dancing on Mike oh, Pence's lawn. That was beautiful. That was beautiful. <laughs> that was that was just, that was that was a couple days ago. Yeah. That, was, that was that was unbelievable. And then last night in front of Trump Tower in New York, um, there was a huge protest. And there's protests all over the place right now. So um, all over the all over yeah all over the place. So then, this, is, this is another reason I think that'd be um, it'd be useful if we could find some time to kind of um, to do another. Uh, kind of intermediate podcast for this week, just because um, this weekend we got uh, tomorrow, right? We've got the Women's March um, in D.C. And, and and cities around the country. There's one in Philadelphia. We're going to have some people from Raging Chicken down in D.C., some people from Raging Chicken um, in Philadelphia, maybe even in Doylestown and some of the other areas. Harrisburg uh, tomorrow is having a, a march tomorrow at 10 o'clock at the Broad Street Market, so like two blocks away from my apartment. Um, I'm looking, I'll probably get out and try to take some photos of it. Uh, before I go to work at 12 o'clock, I don't know if I'll be able to get a story up. But I would like to get, definitely get some uh, pictures up online before I head out to work. That's fantastic. And if there's people out there that are at different protests and um, you've got a little story about the day, um, you can send it to me at editor at ragingchickenpress.org. And, um, you know, and we'll put those stories up, right? Um, editor at ragingchickenpress.org or ragingchickenpress at gmail.com. Either one will work. Um, and send it to me and uh, we'll put those stories up. Um, I think it's important that we get the kind of coverage from progressive media about what, kind of how people have been participating. So, Sean, if I had to leave it to you there, so if it, you know, I know you got to work tonight and things like this but um if you have a uh i've been given a lot of thought to the uh the beer that i'm going to be drinking this evening I'm, i gotta go out for a little bit we got a kind of a function we got to go to and then i want to come back i'm going to be um i've got my my beer lined up for tonight so you got anything in mind for yourself uh not nothing right now i'm kind of like cutting back on the beer since uh new year's i'm um, looking to you know uh Getting getting better shape for my brother's wedding coming up in the summer and uh, going out to uh, California. I'll be doing a lot of hiking out in Yosemite and stuff like that. Um, so I'm cutting off the beer a little bit. But I can tell you, a couple of heavy hitters made their way back to Pizza Boy this week. Okay. Uh, Armor Shark, which is an 11% double IPA, made its way back. Um, really nice. like More like a – I don't, don't know what to say, but it's a really thicker – it's it's a lighter 11.5% beer. 
Um, it's on the it's on the lighter side body wise. And then we came back with Archangel, which is a thirteen percent quadruple IPA. And this time they put blueberries in it, and it Ooh. actually came out really good. Nice, nice. Well, you know, I had I, I've got mine all set for tonight. I tell you what, I wanted. Um, I decided to go with something tonight where uh, at least one of them that is going to be. Uh, well, it goes back to some of the best activism that I ever I've been ever been a part of. Um, you know, I went to school, uh, went to college up in Syracuse, and we had an amazing group of um, folks up there and activists up there. We did a lot of organizing work and so on. Uh, shout out to my friends Ben Tupper and uh, who's done a lot to support this show, and Stu Ross over there in North uh, Northern Ireland, who I was actually supposed to be on a Skype call with right about now, um, but I think we're gonna have to reschedule that because um, my day went crazy. Um, but um, so we're up in Syracuse and doing that. So Syracuse is had a bit of a rebirth. It wasn't, you know, an industrial town. It was a salt town and steel town. And um, but they did some re redevelopment. And there's a, 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 a brewery in, in Syracuse called Middle Ages Brewing Company. And I've always loved their stuff. Um, I mean, I think, you know, I wouldn't say that they make the absolute best beer in the world um, they make some really good stuff um, oh, I thought you were uh, telling me you were bring out some Jenny Ice or Jenny Light no 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 oh no Jenny Cream <clears throat> that would be the most appropriate but <laughs> no, I mean, yeah Jenny Cream was really what we drank <clears throat> Jenny Cream we would actually, actually plop fisherman friends in our Jenny Cream and drink that so uh, <laughs> menthol beer man I, I'm still waiting for the people that are going to do that but um, it was good so the uh, what I wanted, but I couldn't find it. Um, and the limited time I was up in New York last week was um, they have an ale up there called Apocalypse Ale, which is a, um, a strong ale that comes in about 9%. So I couldn't find that, was bummed out. So I, I went to an old standby, which is their, um, their uh, Dragon Slayer. The Russian Imperial Stout um, comes in at 9.5%, um, and uh, which is an awesome. I love this stout, um, and having the Dragon Slayer um, be what was in my glass this evening seemed really appropriate. So um, that's what I'll be having tonight when I get back home and uh, trying to make sense and rewatch uh, the stuff that is going to be playing on TV all day long today. So, Sean, any final thoughts for this week? Let's buckle up and get ready for the next four years. <laughs> I hear you, right? I hear you, right? And as the old labor saying goes, don't mourn, organize. This is Kevin Mahoney, um, the editor and founder of Raging Chicken. We will be back with you next week, maybe twice next week, but we'll be back with you at the very least next Friday um, for Out to Coop podcast with Sean. Hey, Sean, man, um, on this dark day, I wish you well, and I'll talk to you soon. Yep, I'll talk to you later. All right, this is Kevin Mahoney from Raging Chicken. We're out of here. See ya!